Although the creation of the State of Israel has affected almost every portion of the Arab world with massive population migrations, there are still some Jews living on Islamic soil. Jews have lived on Jerba, an island off the southeast of Tunisia, for 25 centuries. Their way of life has changed little in all that time. <laughs> They perpetuate the tradition of a biblical Israel by reading the sacred texts of the Torah. <laughs> The Torah is presented to the congregation just three times a week in accordance with the lunar cycle of the religious year. According to local tradition, the first Jews came to Jerba at the time of the Babylonian captivity after the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. They managed to save a few scrolls of the tables of the law and some of the stones from the temple, on which they afterwards built the recently restored sanctuary of Gibra. This is an especially sacred place for Judaism, and every year, three weeks after the Jewish Passover, it welcomes pilgrims from the world over who assemble there for the pilgrimage of Lach Baumer. Believed to possess miraculous powers, the synagogue has become a place sacred not only to Jews, but to Muslims too. Isolated and distant from any other habitation, the Jews of the neighboring village, Chara Serira, 
refused to read the Torah anywhere else but in the synagogue of Vibra in order to keep alive the memory of the original temple. Another tradition has it that the German Jews are actually the descendants of Berbers who had been originally converted to Judaism by a colony of Jews fleeing the legions of the emperors Titus and Vespasian at the end of the first century AD, when the temple was destroyed for the second time. Nowadays, it is difficult telling a Jew from an Arab. It can only be done through careful attention to details. For example, the Jewish men traditionally wear a black band at the bottom of their trousers to signify their mourning for the destruction of the temple. Having practiced just about every profession imaginable through the centuries, Today's Jews have focused their attention on one of the key businesses of the island, goldsmithing. day-to-day -day language of Jerba, it is difficult distinguishing Jew from Arab. But the Jews have preserved their Hebrew as a living symbol of their will to maintain their special identity. From a religious point of view, the German Jews have not undergone the same evolution as other Jewish communities. Their religion remains primitive. Ethnically, socially and psychologically, says Attilio Gaudio, the Jews of Jelba are living pictures of the Bible.
Although they learn French and Arabic in secular schools, the essential study for the children is their religion, the study of texts dealing with Hebraic tradition. The Jews rise early in the morning and from the age of 13 go to the synagogue three times a day for prayer. Every Jew in Jerba is religious. Each morning they dress in special praying shawls and tie sacred bands of material round their arms and place them on their heads 
as symbols of their devotion in body and spirit to their God. Ethnically, because of their survival and continuation in a potentially hostile land, the Jews of Jerba constitute an exception. Their centuries-long presence on the island stands as proof of the religious tolerance practiced by Jerba's Islamic Arabs. Elsewhere, the Jews have not been so fortunate, but in Jerba, the two communities have adjusted to one another and get along well. The chief rabbi is much more than just the spiritual head of the community. He is the guarantor that the religion and its traditions will be respected. He is the moral leader, the judge in any judicial questions, and the representative of his community to the central government. He is charged with the responsibility for provisioning the community and with the rules for the ritual slaughter of animals. Yeah. 
It is through the scribes that the fame of Jerba spread throughout the Jewish world. Yet even though records have been kept for centuries, there is no written trace of their arrival on the island. With the advent of the printing press, the publication of prayer books has helped the Jews carry on their written tradition. Jerba is one of the last places in the world where the law scrolls are written out by hand. There are very precise rules for the fabrication of writing instruments, and the writing itself requires a particular state of mind, a physical and spiritual purity which few people can attain. On Friday, everyone returns home a little early in order to prepare for the observation of the Sabbath. Saturday is God's day the day of rest, and it is respected in the spirit of the Mosaic law. All activity ceases, even for the animals. It's a day when families gather together and forget about the activities of the week. On Friday evening, the sofa is sounded, a ram's horn, which alerts the village to the advent of the Sabbath. With the lighting of the candles, ten minutes after the second sofa, all activity must cease. <coughs> Oh, 
Even just 30 years ago, the Jewish community still lived in a biblical atmosphere. It was like a small human island protected by its special religious prohibitions, stretching back in time to before there were even Muslims or Romans on the island. But Jerba has evolved more in these past 20 years than it did in the preceding 20 centuries. Everything has changed. Throughout its history, Jerba has withstood countless attempts of invasion. It has resisted Spain, Italy, the papal armies, the Turks, and even for a long time, the central governing body of Tunisia itself. But there is one invader it has proved defenseless against, the tourists. Ada, 
ربي ولا قد يدينا مثل ولدك وخويا زاد اوه قرا برد من حم ولا بد وقت زهور بيت يا بنتو تنس بسيدنا موش ربينو في حضنو يحطو وعدنا Je me suis occupé du ce pèlerinage. I organized the first pilgrimage four years ago. The Tunisian government didn't hesitate to give us their benediction. The next year, we couldn't find kosher food. The only way to do it, I think, is to work something out with the local Jebian Jews. Three years ago, the Tuni Hotel accepted to prepare us kosher food in collaboration with the rabbi in Tunis. The moment we built our travel program around the theme of a pilgrimage and kosher cooking, well, then we succeeded in enrolling more than 500 people. We not only drew people from France, but in addition, we had all of the remaining Jewish community in Tunisia ready to come to Jerba. We come from all areas of Paris, Marseille, from Tunis, from everywhere. Everyone comes to reunite here. Uh, maybe the pilgrimage is a meeting place. But once a year, we receive Jews from France, from Tunis, from Sfax, uh, from almost everywhere. The Jews from uh, Tripoli used to come to Jerba. That made for friendly relations. You mustn't forget that the Jews were at one time in Despoir. For over 2,000 years, they've been traveling and relocating. And they didn't have freedom and justice to give them a free democratic life where they could practice any profession they choose. Don't judge by what you see now. Now in Europe, uh, there's some liberty, some everywhere. But in the past, no, racism existed everywhere. Theoretically, you have to talk with, uh, with them, question them, to, to know the Jews. Their pant cuffs have a black strip on them uh, when they're Jews. Why a black strip? I don't know. Maybe it's to remind them of the destruction of the temple. Dispersed? Because always in these festivities, we are reminded that we're really dispersed, that we're really badly treated everywhere. I'd always heard that there was a community in Jerba. In any case, people from there couldn't be anything other than religious people, seeing that they're a minority, especially since uh, Tunisia became independent and all the Jews in North Africa were asked to leave. If they stayed, it must mean they're very attached to their past in Jerba. À la terre de Djerba. After what we had heard, we knew that the Jewish community in Djerba was a very old colony, especially their synagogue. It's one of the oldest in the world.
راكب كان كل الماكينة وحتى من خطوة هرينا شرش واكب ما تفضاش المعلول والرقيقة علاش المعلولة والرقيقة علاش المعلول The word griba means the abandoned one. I may be wrong, but that might be a saint for which they built this synagogue. And since then, Arabs like Jews have honored it. Often in the streets, You will hear both Jews and Arabs swear on the honor of Griba. Some think she was a Muslim, some think she was a Jew. So thanks to the doubt, Jews and Arabs both go to worship here. Seeing that they built a synagogue and not a mosque, you'd have to assume she probably was a Jew. It's right in the heart of Griba. It's an ancient synagogue which dates back for several hundreds of years. That's for sure. Don't judge Griba by what you see now. I learned that 50 years ago, they brought in some Italian architects and they did some interior decorating. If they had left it like it was, you'd be able to find things much more interesting to look at than uh, what you see now. The Griba is something else. The Griba is a synagogue with legends, many legends, that one told. There were the dispersed ones, for example. After the destruction of the temple, they transported some temple stones with them and constructed elsewhere. I mean, uh, they carried the foundation stones, uh, not everything. They constructed a sacred little temple in Dispora. Some say it wasn't stones, but the door that they took with them. People come here to do the shodot. They find rabbis who read them passages of the Mishnah. Even here at Hara Kiriba, we have a synagogue where four or five people read the Kedik all day long. It's better for the elders to spend their time in the synagogue praying and reading the Psalms of David than to walk the streets all day. Some people say that the menorah is a symbol which represents the synagogue in the village. Certain rabbis' names are listed in synagogues, and they do a menorah with these names all around town, so that people who can't get to the synagogue can embrace these names, like Rabbi Simon ben Yoha and Rabbi Myers. Before, there were a lot of Jews, a lot of older people, and they couldn't get around to embrace the saints in a tent service. With this menorah, you have the names and you can carry them around the town. This menorah, you used to light it with oil, not with candles. The menorah would stop in front of the houses in Harasirva. Each person would pour some oil and then light it to honor the holiness of Rabbi Simon Bar Yohei, just like one honored his parents. This rabbi was a father to them all. Myself, I used to participate. I'd pour a liter of oil, and the rest I'd offer to Griba, because the Griba wasn't rich. 
uh, then like she is now. She didn't have a lot of oil. She didn't uh, even have a franc. You have to believe now that there's gold in there. There's gold for sure. The Jews brought it. That's what they say. No, I haven't been inside. I've been there, but I didn't go inside. Oh, yes, a lot of people go inside, that's for sure. The guy just explained some things about these cupboards covered in gold and silver ex votos, about the very old parchments of the law, about the pilgrimage in the month of May, and the legend about the eggs in the cave and the young girls that are to be married. I came to Jerba on my way to Griba, not to play around and to go to the Oriental concerts or go to the cafes. My duty is to be in Griba morning till night. <laughs> In my opinion, it's better for the youngsters to go to Griba, even if it's for profane reasons. Take a look, eat kosher food, but don't go dancing in the hotels at night. We will be tempted to eat non-kosher food. Me, uh, Griba, I don't go. I go at other moments, for Sukkot, Pesha. For the pilgrimage, no, because the pilgrimage is a night for Rabbi Simon Bar Yohei, or Rabbi Meyer. It's a commemoration for their death. One should read these writings and pray for their souls in heaven. It's not for having fun, playing music, looking at the girls, all those sorts of horrible things. No, that's sinning. It's sacrilegious. If you'd like to know something else, for certain people, the pilgrimage is very sacred. Everything you do outside of the religious activities is profane. I don't agree with this. On the contrary, if there's something you want to do other than this, I feel you should. It's better you do it in a religious environment. I'm not a fanatic, and I feel at least like, like uh, that they can learn to respect certain things. I must say we're aware of the Jewish problem in Tunisia. We are concerned with our responsibility to help preserve these traditions. The patrimony, which we consider as part of ours, is part of our national patrimony. We cherish it. It is a Tunisian tradition, expressed in a different religious way. That's the way we see the Jewish patrimony in Tunisia. Il faut 
tira no coraje. We in the government, we encourage these types of activities, especially on the island of Jeva. We like to point out that this is an activity that could be carried out by Jews, Muslims, or any other religion, which underlines the freedom of religious worship that exists in our country. On pouvait aussi la liberté de la religion dans notre pays. The government is interested in the tourist attraction also, because uh, there's not a lot of things to see in Jerba. You have to look to find them, the Spanish fort and so forth. So one of the interesting places is the synagogue of Griba. If the tourist asks, what is there to see in Jerba, they'll tell them the Spanish fort, the Kirala pottery, and the synagogue of Griba. That's something very beautiful. When you come out of the Griba, you go directly to the village. You stop in a very old synagogue, which is Rabbi Abraham Cohen's synagogue. Then following the route of the menorah, you come to a very ancient house, one of the first organizers of the pilgrimage. And then you return to Griba. Legends were passed down from father to son. They established many, many things. They said that Griba was a girl and that no one knew where she came from. She was Jewish, she was alone, she was pious, she was sincere, and she lived in a cabin in the Griba forest. The cabin burnt to the ground, but they found her corpse intact. There was something miraculous about this, and that's why they called Griba the miracle Griba. Very long ago, a young girl, a foreigner of unknown origin, came all alone to live in the village and refused all hospitality and all contact with the villagers. She lived in a tent where she prayed and contemplated. No one ever knew if she was Jewish, Berber, or Christian. But in any case, everyone admired her. One day, the island was struck by a violent storm. Her home was hit by lightning and burned to the ground. No one knows by what miracle her corpse was spared. They say she had a smile on her face and that she was very serene. Her name was Griba. So this unknown was buried at the exact spot where a temple was soon built, grew bigger and more beautiful, and became the synagogue. There is a brochure published by the Department of Tourism which points out the things to visit on the island of Djerba. Each person will choose a legend which pleases him the most. For instance, the Muslims prefer that Griba remain of unknown origin. In that way, they can enter the Jewish synagogue. Griba is not only for the Jews, She's for everyone, an unknown girl. Each one chooses the version he prefers.
Once I saw an Arab woman holding a child in her arms. She was asking one of the religious assistants at the synagogue where she should pour the oil she had with her. I became interested and I asked the assistant, there are Muslims who bring their offerings to the synagogue? He said, oh yes, there are Muslims who come. And he told me the story of this woman. Her son was gravely ill, dying. She made a vow to Griba and she came and she lit a lamp. Her son was spared and now she regularly brings oil to Griba. That's what the man from the synagogue told me. I saw her. I believe him. I certainly should. I saw the woman and the child. One believes, one becomes a believer. Thank <laughs> you.